thank you everyone for joining us today for our second virtual meetup for our ladies Philly. Uh, today, today's topic is AB testing in R with Ellie Fight. Um, thank you all for joining and I'd like to thank our sponsors, our sponsor, Our Ladies Global. Um, so for today's virtual meetup, it is being recorded. Um, if you find any suspicious activity or trolls, please inform one of the organizers. Uh, if you have questions, uh, you can raise your hand um, or type the questions in the chat. We also have a, a Google Doc that we're going to populate with questions. And that's in the chat, so you can find that there. And attendees will be muted. Um, so for today's, uh, to, sorry, <laughs> for today's meetup, um, we have a link to the slides. Um, we also have a, uh, for, sorry, links to the slides. Um, we have our code of conduct for our ladies, Philly, that you can check out. Um, so our ladies, uh, it's a worldwide organization. We're promoting gender diversity in the R community through uh, meetups, mentorship, um, in a friendly, safe way. Um, and for our group, we recently launched a uh, mentor speaker directory. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And the purpose of this is to connect people with expertise uh, to, so they can share their knowledge with people who are um, interested, curious in other uh, areas that they may know a little less about and want to gain more um, knowledge. And we also have a speaker directory. So if you would like to uh, be a speaker at one of these events, uh, please sign up. Um, and we have upcoming events. We have a uh, social happy hour. Sorry, we have a virtual social <laughs> happy hour, uh, Friday, May 22nd, and then we have another virtual event in June, um, Intro to Art and Data Science Lightning Talks. Um, that's June 9th. Uh, yeah, so today uh, our speaker is Ellie Fife from Drexel University, LeBeau College of Business. She's a professor of marketing. Uh, she develops data analysis methods um, to inform marketing decisions on uh, things like product design and advertising campaigns. So without further ado. Hi everyone. Uh, let me start my video so that you guys can see me and uh, get my slides up. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I remember when Our Ladies Philly was um, just an idea and uh, a couple of people came in to the LeBeau School and uh, talked to me about it. Um, can you guys all see my screen? Someone in the chat, let me know. Not, not yet? Yeah. You got it? Great. All right. Um, yeah, I remember when Our Ladies Philly was sort of just an idea and a few of the organizers um, came to meet with me at uh, Drexel uh, and Drexel as a whole, not just me, just could not be more proud to have this in Philadelphia happening. So um, my super big thanks for the to the organizers for everything that they have done. Uh, to get this meetup off the ground, and thanks again for inviting me to give this talk. I'm, I'm excited about it. So uh, today we're going to talk about advanced A-B testing. Um, all of you got the link in the chat to the slides, so if you want to follow on with the slides, you'll, you'll, the landing page is this web page, and if you want to follow the introduction at home, you can click on that link that says introduction, and your going to open a web page that is essentially the slides that I'm going to go through. So that gives you access to those. Um, the other thing is I really love questions. So if you have questions, please make sure to put them in the chat. Uh, and then there's a link in the chat to a Google document. You can add your questions right there. And I'll be breaking every once in a while. Um, and the Our Ladies organizers will go ahead and ask me uh, questions. Um, I think it's Daria is going to be chiming in and reading some of your questions out loud so that I can get some feedback from you guys. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, this tutorial is about uh, 
it's called advanced A-B testing. It's really sort of basic, but it's more, if you've run an A-B test using one of the sort of tools like Optimizely or an email, like MailChimp testing tool, um, you haven't really thought about the statistics or the analysis associated with A-B testing. So it's advanced in the sense that we're gonna think a little bit harder about how we could analyze an A-B test. And I'm gonna use R as the platform for um, doing that analysis because that's the lingua franca for everyone who's here in this meetup. Um, so let me just jump right in. Um, hopefully most of you figured out what an A-B test is. This is actually the thing we learned about in like eighth grade science fair. Uh, so we're going to take, but it's kind of the marketing version of that. So we're gonna take all of the, say the visitors who come to our website and we're going to randomly assign half of them to see variation A, which is green in this little diagram here. Uh, the other half are gonna see variation B, which is blue in the diagram. And then we measure what happens to customers after they're exposed to that marketing treatment. And there's lots of different things we could measure. In this little example, we're measuring conversion, which is digital marketing speak for they bought something or they downloaded something or they did something that we wanted them to do. Um, and you can see we got more people doing whatever good thing this is in variation B. Um, and so that means B is probably the one that we want to run on our website. Um, here's another example um, that's a little bit more concrete. This comes from Optimizely, which is one of the A-B testing platforms for websites. It's like software that you integrate into your website to facilitate doing A-B tests. And one of their clients is Smart Wool, the socks. Um, I'm a huge fan of them now that I don't wear shoes anymore. Uh, and so that was a joke. I can't hear you laughing, but I, I know in your hearts you are. Um, I know in my heart that you're laughing at my, my shoe joke. Um, so anyway, oh, thank you for the chats. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, anyway, in this example, they had this kind of like groovy website where there were bigger socks and smaller socks and this nice uh, picture of people wearing the socks at the top. And that was how the website was before. And they decided to simplify it and make it look more like every other website where you buy stuff. Uh, so all the socks are small and there's no header. Uh, get, let's get right down to the business of buying socks. And they found that, so they randomly assigned these web pages to people who were visiting the SmartWool website. And they found that in the variation, the average revenue per visitor, so that's a common metric that digital marketers like to use. How many dollars do I get from you when you visit my website? Um, and so uh, in this case, you got 17% more average revenue per visitor uh, in the variation. So it's just, it's so easy. The steps are, we're gonna randomly assign customers to treatments, we're gonna measure responses. And then we're going to compare groups to determine how that treatment changes the response. And this has become wildly popular in all of marketing um, and also to some extent software design. So you'll see A-B testing used by a big company like Facebook to test changes to the design of the Facebook website or to test changes to the design of the feed and what information is being pushed into the feed. Uh, you'll see it in um, websites, you'll see it in emails, um, you can see it sometimes in social media advertising, you can run an A-B test. Actually, Facebook has a tool to do that. Uh, Google has a tool to do that with display ads. Um, so it really is kind of agnostic to the medium. And actually, the idea of running a randomized experiment is agnostic to, it doesn't have to be a marketing thing, of course. Uh, people do this in medicine in economics, in policy. There's lots of places that we could do experiments. I'm gonna mostly talk about examples that relate to marketing. Um, all right, so why is this such a popular thing? Like, why does it work? Well, the trick is that by randomizing over a large number of customers, we can create two groups that are equal on average. Um, so, and intentionally the picture here is red apples and green apples. So it's not that all the customers are the same. Customers are very different one from another. Um, so there's gonna be green apples, red apples, maybe some oranges. But on average, the mix that we're gonna get when we randomize will be the same in the two groups. And that's, that's kind of the secret sauce of this whole thing. Um, so any differences that we see between the two groups after we apply the treatment 
has to have been caused by the treatments. It can't be anything else. It can't be that the group on the left happens to be all green apples and the group on the right happens to be all red apples. They're, they're on average the same. And so we can say that the treatment caused an effect. So it's really kind of the killer application for figuring out what types of marketing work and what don't work. If you just do things like look at like what were our sales in aggregate when we were running this ad, well now you're changing the ads over time and time is changing everything else and there could be a pandemic that happened in there and um, it's just not as good as if we can take the customers and randomly um, divide them up and show one group one thing and the other group another thing. Um, and so when I teach this class, and I actually see that uh, Mihir Cheda is on, she has taken the class from me. Uh, so I teach a full semester class in this as part of the marketing analytics program. There's a, sorry, there's a, it's not marketing analytics, it's a business analytics degree, and I teach a marketing elective in that program. And I make the students say out loud, one, two, three, repeat with me, randomization will set you free. Um, because it really does simplify the analysis versus a lot of more sophisticated methods that are like big machine learning models that are used in marketing are often used with observational data and you don't really need those when you have a clean uh, well-designed experiment so um, hopefully i've convinced you that randomization will set you free um, all right, so here's my plan for the workshop. Um, this workshop was originally designed as sort of a four to six hour workshop. So we're just gonna do the first two modules, but the other modules are there and you can um, take a look at those if you want. Um, the, you, the links are on that landing page that uh, you have in the chat. And um, so we're gonna kind of go through the first module, which is just the basics of how you analyze an A-B test. And the second module is what to do when you have a really big sample size in your A-B test, what other fancier things can you do as part of the analysis. Um, I am not going to talk about like the mechanics of how you execute an A-B test on Facebook. I'm gonna be kind of platform agnostic and focus on the analysis piece of it. So if you were hoping to have me give a bake-off between which tool is better, Google um, content experiments or Optimizely, uh, I, this is not the right talk for you. We're gonna focus on kind of the mechanics of how we analyze it. Um, all right, uh, a little bit more about me. Um, thanks Daria for the really, Darina, I'm sorry, for the um, really uh, nice introduction, but just to give the audience a little bit deeper of sense of where I'm coming from, I teach data-driven digital marketing to undergrads and marketing experiments to grad students at Drexel. Um, I also, for my research, I develop marketing analytics tools. So um, the paper I'm most excited about right now is this test and roll paper. You can take a look at that link. Um, that's about profit maximizing A-B tests. Um, the, uh, I also have a book called R for Marketing Research and Analytics. You can actually see it back behind me. Uh, it's R Springer red and orange. Um, and so if you're interested in applying mar R to marketing problems, uh, you might take a look at that book. If you're extremely tidyverse oriented, you won't like that book because it's all base R. Um, and before I got to being a professor, I've always kind of worked in industry kind of like in, in the intersection between industry and academia. So I worked at General Motors in the R&D labs. I was a methodologist at the Modelers, which is a small uh, boutique market research consultancy. And uh, I worked for about five years at Wharton running the customer analytics initiative. Um, so I kind of sit uh, well connected to kind of what's going on in industry and I try to stay connected to industry. So it won't be, this won't be a super academic thing. Um, all of the materials, you've seen the links lots of times now, uh, so you can follow this link and you'll get to that landing page that has links for each of the slides, uh, for each of the sections. If you are a more sophisticated R user and you know what I'm saying, uh, R Markdown source is available if you just go straight to the GitHub. So it's on my GitHub, the repo is called AB Test. And you can see the actual source markdown files that produce the slides that I'm talking to. So if you are um, like a hands-on kind of person and you have R skills already and you know how to run the code chunks, I would encourage you to open the R markdown file right now for um, module 
I guess it's two, um, the, the for, there's the intro module and then the first analysis module. Um, so open that up and you can be running the code chunks as we go and you can play with the data yourself if you want to. Um, just a, uh, a note on this, I am not intending to teach R. So my goal here is to teach you about analyzing A-B testing. So if you have um, stumbled in here and you don't know R yet, that's great. Uh, our ladies loves people who don't know R yet, um, and there's going to be lots of other meetups that you can um, attend that would focus on learning R. Uh, but for today, what I'd like you to do is focus on the A-B testing part and then let me drive the R syntax. Um, so I won't be like discussing the syntax in detail or um, answering questions live about like, what is, does that line of code do? Maybe I'll answer some of those, we'll see. Um, but also, if you have those kinds of questions, put them in the Google Doc, because lots of people who are answering questions in the Google Doc know those kind of R syntax questions, um, how to answer those. If you're learning R, I would also kind of say, why don't you stay in, in the mode where you're gonna focus on the A-B testing part, and then you can go back and learn the R later. Um, I really don't want to get stuck in kind of the syntactical mud, so to speak. Um, I want to focus on the concepts and then uh, the concepts statistically, and then you guys can go back later and learn the code. If you know R well, I've already said, download those R markdown files and, and follow along with me. Um, and I'm super adaptable, so I've taught this to people who didn't know a lick of R. I've taught this to people who know way more R than I know, um, and all of those are fine. Um, I can answer all kinds of questions. So um, let's jump in. Let's get started. Uh, just, uh, I'm a car girl. Did you notice the syntactical mud? That's a car analogy deep down. Um, I love cars. And uh, this is me and my daughter, um, who is not this little anymore. Um, but I love this picture. So let's go. Let's get driving. Um, let me get these slides. So I'm opening the, let me follow the link just so that you can see how to go. Um, so this is the, the landing page. I'm gonna start with module two, AB test basics. Uh, so you just click that link right there and you will be in the slides. All right, uh, I'm gonna just pause and see if there's any like process questions. That was really just the process kickoff. Are we good? Uh, there was an answer about, oops, sorry, there was a question um, about sampling. Uh, how do you ensure you are sampling as diversely as possible? Uh, same type of users may have similar use times of day. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, in general, when uh, people do this in marketing, they tend to run the test on the entire population. So everybody who comes to your website, you would uh, randomize into one treatment or the other, but you would want to run the test for at least a week because there's huge weekly variation, weekly, weekly seasonality that we see in website behavior. People who are browsing your SOC website on Saturday might be very different and have different goals than people who are browsing on Monday. So you tend to run the test for the whole week and then analyze those as kind of a whole week is representative of kind of on average all the customers that come to our website. So um, uh, any other questions, Dorina? All right, let's get, let's jump into the analysis part. So um, I'm going to be working with a test data set. Um, full disclosure, the data set is fake. I made it myself. Uh, and actually the code is in the repo if you want to make a different version of it or play around with uh, generating the data. But from now on, I'm going to talk about it like it's real. The data set feels pretty real. And I based it on analysis of other email A-B tests I've done. So the test was conducted. It, we, we're not going to talk about how it was conducted, but it was conducted by an online wine store. Uh, and so this is a store you can browse, you can click what kind of wine you want and then have it shipped uh, to your house. And so they conducted an email test 
So the goal of the email was uh, to send emails to existing customers um, to remind them that like, hey, you can come to our website and buy wine. Uh, and so just to summarize the email test, the setting was an email, uh, to, uh, an email to the retailer email list. So the people on the email list are like people who've signed up to be on the email or people who've made a purchase, basically all the emails that the retailer has captured in the past. Um, the unit of analysis, and I'll talk more about that later, is the email address. So we're randomizing the treatment to the email address. Uh, so some emails are going to uh, get email version A, some people are going to get email version B, and we're going to have a third condition, which in marketing we call holdout. Um, some people call this control. They didn't receive the email. We just took a group of people and said, let's not send them the email at all because maybe people hate our emails. I am so sick of emails that say, uh, we hope you're doing well in this troubled time from retailers, and I might not actually go to a website if I get that terrible email. So um, in this case, the retailer wanted to have that holdout condition to make sure that their emails weren't backfiring or, or causing people to buy less. Um, the response that we're going to measure is three. We're actually going to have three responses. The first one is, did they open the email? The second one is, did they click the email? And the third one is, how much did they buy from us in the month after the email? So that's the one month purchases. Uh, and that, that's measured in dollars. So um, the selection, which I can't remember who it was who asked a question about selection. The selection is going to be all active customers. So there is no selection. These are everyone that we have access to emails for. Uh, and the assignment will be randomly assigned, a third, a third, a third. And this is where you say, one, two, three, repeat with me. Randomization will set you free. Um, all right. So let's jump in and look at the data. So we, we, this retailer has already um, run the, the A-B test. Uh, if you wondered how they could run it, well, like you can run an A-B test in email using Gmail. I actually do this uh, with the welcome email for my class. I send two versions of the welcome email one that's very long and wordy and cheerful and kind of like talking to me, and one that's like, please fill out this introductory survey. And then I use as my response how many people and how fast they, they answer that survey, and time and time again, the short email wins. Um, and the way I actually do this is I put all the names in a Google Sheet, I randomly assign them to one condition or another, and then I cut and paste the emails into Gmail and I send out the emails. Uh, and in that email, there's a link to a Google form, and they put their name in the Google form so I can match everything back up and say which condition you were in and how quickly you answered the form or did you not answer the form at all. So it's pretty simple to do uh, with email. Uh, so you can do it yourself with just Google tools, um, but most big retailers would have a tool specifically for doing email A-B testing. It might be um, one of these fancier uh, like online marketing suites, um, but it might also be uh, like an email specific tool like MailChimp has a email tool and Constant Contact has an email A-B testing tool. Uh, so that's just to answer like where would this data come from? So the data has been collected and now um, we merged it with our customer relationship management data set. So we actually know some things about these customers from before they got the email. Um, so just to, to go through the variables here, so we have a user ID, we have a campaign ID. That's always the, the user ID is just the number for the customer. The campaign ID is always the same. That's this email campaign. Um, and we have the group, that's which group they were in. Did they get the control, the email A, the email B? Uh, I also created a variable that's just called email, that's just true, false for whether they got the email, um, if we wanted to combine those A and B groups together. Uh, we'll get to that eventually. I have these, these three next three variables, open, click, and purchase are uh, whether they opened the email, whether they clicked the email, and whether they made a purchase and how much it was. Um, you can see most of the purchases are zero. That's typical in marketing. Most people don't buy anything. Um, 
Oh, open, one little like digital marketing uh, insider detail. Open means they downloaded the pictures in the email. So that's just the standard for how that's recorded. People don't know if, in general, someone who sends you an email doesn't know if you opened the email, but if they put a picture and the picture has an HTML link and you download the picture, then they know that you did look at the email. And so that's how open is recorded. Click is recorded um, usually through the web analytic system because you click a link that um, in the email that sends you to the website and all that visit is tracked. So that's where that stuff comes from. Um, it's always important to know where your data comes from. So if you have like clarifying questions on that, let me know. Um, so, uh, oh, someone's asking a clarifying question. Thank you, Martine. So yes, if she's asking if the email is false, is the open also always false? And that is true, always zero, and it is true. They can't open the email if they didn't receive the email. So um, good data checking question. Uh, we should probably write some code to when we do our data checking to make sure that that does hold, but that should hold. Um, all right, the next variables, what's all this stuff here? Well, we after purchase, we have actually information about the customers from before they got the email. So we have actually their prior purchases in other, in the wine by category. So we know how much Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Syrah, and Cabernet they bought in the past. Uh, we know total what their past purchases were. So this person in the first row has bought $33.94 of Syrah, and that's all that she's bought. Just the, the total is $33.94 as well, so that's the only category she's bought in. Um, days since is how long it's been since she last made a purchase, and the number of visits is how many times she's visited the website in the past. Uh, and so this is typically stuff that's tracked in a CRM database. Um, and so we've merged that data from the CRM database into the email test data. Um, it was merged on the user ID and now we have these full records. Um, all right, so any, if there are any questions about the data. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, what happens when an email test goes to a user and they visit the website, but not by clicking on the link? Because they're paranoid about phishing emails. Is that lost? Uh, yes. Um, uh, it can go both ways. So it, uh, it cannot be tracked to the user unless the user logs into the website. So let's say it's not, if they were afraid of phishing, then that wouldn't have been measured. They, that would not have been recorded as a click. Um, because, so some, some uh, the reason I'm hesitating, some marketers actually do try to connect that, uh, but it only, they can only record visits to the user ID if the user logs in. So if the user doesn't log in, most retailers will let you browse their website without logging in. Uh, that visit doesn't get recorded and the same would be true for this visits variable So this visits variable is only the visits where they logged in or they made a purchase or they did something else that was says you who this is who I am um, Does that I hope that answers the question on the data uh, There's also a question about how do we ensure that we're not sending um, multiple emails to the same individual uh, that is actually done through a process called deduping. So uh, there are actually commercial vendors who do nothing but try to scan through emails um, and uh, deduplicate emails that appear to be the same or if the name and the address appears to be similar enough that it's probably the same person, they'll remove one of those before they send the emails out. Now, if somebody is like really into monitoring A-B tests and they create a bunch of burner accounts, um, in order to get multiple emails and then pick the best offer, well, um, that would be in the data. Um, we wouldn't be able to tell that those are different customers. Good question, though. All right, I'm going to jump into the analysis so we can actually um, learn something about this data, but it's always good to spend a little bit of time getting to know your data, making sure you understand what's in the data. 
Um, I find that junior analysts that I teach often like jump into they're running some kind of neural net scikit learn with Python or something and they still don't know what all the variables mean. And I find it really important for data scientists to just sit and get to know the data, talk to people that collected the data, make sure I understand the details um, of what that data actually represents. All right, so um, getting back to A-B testing analysis, there's three types of variables associated with a test. Um, and I'll generally call them the X's, the Y's, and the Z's. So the X's are the treatments. That's the thing you randomized. In this case, it was the variable called group, which indicates what, whether they got email A, email B, or no email. So that's the X. Um, then we have responses, which are Y's. And in this case, the outcome, um, that's the outcome measured for each customer. And we have three of those. We have the opens, the clicks, and the purchase amount. Um, and then the third category, which a lot of people forget about, this is like, this is the part that's kind of, you might, someone might consider advanced A-B testing, is these baseline variables. So these are the Z's. This is other stuff we know about customers prior to the randomization. Some people call these pre-randomization covariates. Actually, the econ people call them pre-randomization covariates, which I find tedious, but accurate. They're things we know about the people before they were randomized into the treatment. Some people just call them observables. Um, the biostats people tend to call them baseline variables and I like that language, so that's what I'll use. There isn't really a standard for it in marketing yet. Um, all right, so we have, whoa, sorry, um, that fingering my keyboard. Um, so our treatment indicator, our X, is the group variable, and I just did a summary of it there. And we have 41,330 people in control, 41,329 people in email A, and 41,329 people in email B. And uh, that thing where we've kind of even, we've made the groups as even as possible, that is a completely randomized experiment. Just you can throw that out there when you want to sound like a statistician. Oh, we ran a completely randomized experiment. Um, the whys that we have are the opens, the clicks, and the purchases. And here I've just done a summary so we can see the average of open is 0.456, which means 45.6% of people opened the email. For clicks, it's 7.5% click the email. And for purchase in the next month after the test, it's uh, 2130 on average, but the median is zero, which means that more than half the people didn't buy anything. And this is kind of typical for a retail, um, retail transaction kind of data. Um, if you have an ongoing relationship with a retailer, there's actually a pretty good chance you will open the email and look at it. These emails often have promo offers and people kind of like that for retailers that they have a relationship with. Um, the click rate is also typical and kind of indicative of how much did people like that promo or whatever product was featured in the email. Um, like I get emails from Old Navy and they're like, uh, fuzzy, fuzzy pants. That's all they're selling right now. Fuzzy pants, soft pants, comfortable pants. Um, and so if people like that offer, uh, they'll tend to click on the email. And that purchase amount is just a kind of typical typical purchase amount data. Um, the third group we have is the baseline variables. And so um, the three probably most important ones we have are the days since their last purchase. Um, so customers that are old, like this, the there's a customer who hasn't made a purchase in 992 days. So that customer is like three years old. They might, they might have moved on. The email actually might not be good anymore. Um, but the fact that they haven't interacted with us in a while is a kind of a bad sign that they're not really interested in us anymore. Um, the number of visits is kind of self-explanatory. How many times have they visited our website in the past? And the, the amount of past purchases is actually really indicative of the relationship the customer has. So, um, we're sort of worried about this customer. Um, this is sort of basic data checking. We have a customer who's bought $9,636.92. Uh, I don't know, maybe they ho hosted a wedding or something. <laughs> um, maybe they hosted a couple of weddings. Maybe they're a caterer. Uh, 
we might think about cleaning that kind of data out, but it's not like, it's not $100,000 worth of wine so that they're not like a distributor or something. So everything looks good. Um, we have that data. Um, oh, I see the, I just saw Rachel's question about the click rate. Um, so she's asking, do you include people who didn't open up the email in the denominator for click? In this case, I am not. The denominator here is gonna be everyone. So when I did the calculation, let me just jump back. When I did this calculation here, I was averaging over everyone, including people who didn't get the email. Um, I guess if you were reporting to management on the click rate for the email, you're right that we probably should take out those people who didn't receive the email at all. In the industry, some people would also take out the people who didn't open the email, but some people leave them in, and that's like one of the big gotchas when you're analyzing this kind of data. When someone reports an email click rate, you need to ask the question, are you counting people who didn't open the email as part of that rate? Um, just because the, the people who make the reporting tools like MailChimp and Constant Contact haven't settled on what the industry standard is for that definition. All right, um, we have a few more baseline variables, which are those purchase amounts in the different, um, the different categories of wine. So that actually, this is one little thing. I keep worrying about this person who bought $9,600 worth of wine. They bought all Chardonnay. I don't know, that seems like a lot of Chardonnay for one customer, but. Um, we'll leave them in the data unless I usually don't throw away data unless there's some really good explanation for why that data doesn't represent the population I'm trying to understand. All right, so we're ready. Now we've looked at the data. We're ready to analyze the data. Um, so just in the chat, uh, I'll ask every kind of to everyone, um, what is the first present first question you should ask about an AP test? If someone sends you a data file like this, what's the first question you should ask? So the outcome is the purchase amount or the clicks. Um, what is varied from A to B? That's a good question. I would probably ask that question, but it wouldn't be the first question. I'm afraid that Alice is kind of, Alice Walsh asked, was it random? Um, and Teus asked, is A different from B? So, Everyone wants to answer that question first, is A different than B? And we will get there, but um, Alice and Drashidi, who is a Ringer student from one of my classes who knew this already, um, both came up with what I think is the right answer, which is um, not did the treatment affect the response. We will get to did the treatment affect the response, is A different than B? But the first question we wanna ask was, did they do the randomization correctly? And it is amazing how often randomization is not done correctly. And I'll tell you a little story about that. So um, it's a, it comes from a medical experiment. So there was a medical experiment done in Canada where they wanted to see if getting more mammograms would improve uh, how long you live. Ideally, if the mammogram finds cancer and get treated for the cancer, then you don't die of cancer and that would be good but people are also worried that uh, the mammogram might find a cancer that really isn't a bad cancer, and then you have surgery and you die in the surgery. Um, and so that's not so good. And so they just were asking the question, will people live longer? Um, and the randomization strategy they had was that as people came into the clinic and um, enrolled in the trial, every other line was treatment and control. And the, so the treatment was to get more mammograms and the control was to get fewer mammograms. Uh, and the nurses who were doing the enrolling figured this out. Uh, they figured out that every other line was uh, more mammograms. So if they had a patient that they thought would benefit from more mammograms because say they'd had cancer before or someone in their family had had cancer, um, they would skip a line and push them into the treatment group. And when they got the data back, 
um, and analyzed it for, well, what's the effect of this treatment? The raw data was saying, oh no, um, it, it seems like the mammograms actually do um, both cause you to die, be more likely to die and more likely to get cancer. And they're like, wait, how could the mammograms make you more likely to get cancer? And, and there was like a whole forensic study where they figured out, they actually interviewed the nurses and found out that, that what was happening was the nurses were pushing sicker patients or patients more likely to get cancer into the treatment group. So the randomization was broken. Um, so yes, as Jesse says, this is an epic fail. Um, but it's also, you'd think like, oh, randomizing the email, that's not so hard. You're gonna get the computer to draw a random number, won't be so bad. But it it is actually very possible to get it screwed up. So the first thing we should do is check that. So if we're gonna check the randomization, how would we check the randomization with data? I'll let you, I'll give you a second to type it into the chat. Yep, you guys got it. You, you're too smart for me. Um, so we're going to use the Z variables and we're going to do what's called a randomization check. And uh, it's all we're trying to do is uh, um, confirm that for the baseline variables that we we're supposed to have randomized over, um, those should be equal across the, the treatment groups. So for instance, here, I'm just uh, using a little bit of deep flyer to compute, this isn't deep flyer, this is, I don't know, I don't, I'm not a tidyverse person, but you can read that syntax there. What I'm doing is I'm computing the average of um, how many days it's been since their last purchase. And we can see that's right around 90 for all three groups. And then I compute the average of how many visits they had to the website prior to the email. And that's right around 5.95. And then I compute the mean of their past purchases and that's right around 190. So the group means are similar between groups. Uh, but we can take this a step further. Um, oh, sorry, I, I forgot about this slide. So the purchase incidents, uh, so this is, I just took the past purchases, you can see the, in the uh, description there. I took the past purchases and checked whether they were greater than zero. So I'm just computing how many of the customers had made a purchase in the past. And it's around 74%. And that's typical for CRM data. Like you'll get some people that join your mailing list but never make a purchase. Uh, but most of the people, the reason they're on the mailing list is because they made a purchase. Um, so that looks good, but we can take this a step further. We can actually look at the full distribution of the baseline variable across groups. So this chart is a little bit tricky to read, but what it is, is I have um, plotted a histogram of past purchases. So the past purchase amount. So most people have kind of small past purchases, but some people have some really big past purchase amounts. And I have... Um, plotted a histogram for each of the three groups, control email A and email B, and they're, they're transparent. So when they stack on top of each other, they get a kind of gray color. You see how there's like a little bit of pink, a little bit of green? That's like kind of some noise in the data, but basically the distribution of past purchase amount looks spot on the same. Um, and so this is even better than computing the average. We're really looking at the whole distribution and it looks like um, one way to think about it is these are the green apples and these are the red apples and we've got the same number of green and red apples in the group. So it, it looks good. Um, I'm going to do that again. I'll look at the days since last activity. So last time I had a purchase from the customer and the same thing we get like this nice gray overlapping histogram with little bits of pink and green popping out here and there, which is really not too much to worry about. Um, I am not keeping up with the questions. I got you guys going and now you're going too fast for me. I apologize. Um, we'll stop for questions in a minute. Um, I'm gonna skip the exercise. Oh, it is time to stop for uh, questions. So let me, um, I can take a look through the chat. Uh, let's, the one that caught my eye was the one from, I can't say that, Laziob? I'm not sure. Sorry if I mangled your screen name. Um, asked if you could do a Mann-Whitney test on those distributions. Yes, um, absolutely. You could do a t-test on those means that I reported in the first thing. 
Um, so all of those tests that you do, but you, it, there, it's kind of backwards because you're hoping to not reject the null. So you want to accept the null that the distributions are the same. Um, so, uh, and Kelsey is asking about the consistency. Is it artificially generated? Yes. Uh, that is my little secret with this. Um, the data is artificially generated, so it looks very, very good. But the thing about randomization is even if your distributions, so your distributions might be more bumpy, but you will still get the groups looking very, the, very much the same. So because randomization really does, um, if you randomize over a large enough number of customers, you will get exactly the same distribution in all three groups. Uh, so I guess I'll go back just to make sure that's clear. Um, so like the fact that this looks like a nice, maybe log normal distribution, that's a property of the fake data that you might not see in the real data. But the fact that they overlap so completely is um, really a property of the randomization. Uh, one, two, three, repeat with me, randomization will set you free. All right, so um, the randomization checks out. And uh, we can go on to answering the question everybody really wants to know, which is, um, what are the treatment effects? So did the treatments affect the response? So the first thing I would do um, is just uh, summarize each of the groups. All right, so I have three Y variables. I have the opens, the clicks, and the purchases. And I'm just going to compute the averages of those for the three uh, different treatment groups. So the, for opens, we have no opens in the control group. That's good. The control group worked. They didn't get the email, so they couldn't open it. Um, and so, but we can look at the difference in opens between A and B, and it looks like the A email was opened more. The A email was also clicked more. Um, but it didn't actually produce much of a difference in the purchase amount. Those look pretty similar. If anything, the email B is, has a higher average than email A. Um, so just comparing A and B, it looks like email A, a was something that encouraged the customers to visit our website, but didn't quite get them to buy. It wasn't something that everybody was like, yeah, I need that right away. Um, then um, for the mean purchase amount, we can actually do have a mean purchase amount for the control group. Uh, and so the way that's tracked is that the control group, we know who we sent the email to, and then when they check out, they give us their email. And so um, connecting those two dots together, we can look at actually how much did people in the control group buy, even though they didn't get the email, um, and they're buying a lot less than the two treatment groups. And so that actually looks pretty reasonable. Um, and this might be as far as you go if you weren't a statistician, right? Like a lot of the A-B testing tools just report these kinds of averages and people make decisions um, based on that. Uh, since I'm a statistician, I like to dig a little bit deeper. And so um, I like to, Oh, I forgot about this slide. I'm gonna skip it. Um, I'll go. I'll come back to it. Uh, so, getting back to what I was saying, um, I would like to do some kind of a statistical test. And so, the natural thing to do for, say, the open rate is to do a test of proportions. Um, and so, that function is prop test. And a handy little trick: um, you can do x tabs, which is a base R way of making a table and then pass that straight into prop test and it knows what to do. So this is one of those old school base R tricks that works really well, um, makes your code really nice and clean. And what this is doing is doing um, a binomial test to compare the um, open rate between the, these are just for the, um, the email, the two email groups because the open rate is obviously zero for the other group, so I'm gonna leave them out. And so um, it computes a 95% confidence interval for the difference, uh, the difference in the proportion, and it's saying the confidence interval is that um, the better email is between 6% and 7.29% uh, better than the other email. So that's telling us that these differences, I'll go back a second, we go back to just the table, 
these differences that we're seeing right here, the 71.8% versus 65.2%, those differences are statistically significant. So um, we can go ahead and tell, um, tell business people that yes, email A definitely got more people to open it than email B. Um, just as a marketer, I started thinking like, uh, probably has to do with the subject line because if we got more people to open it, the only thing they saw before they opened it was the subject line. So there was something in the subject line of email A that was good. Um, and so we can tell the people in the business that whatever you did in email A, that was, uh, that was a good subject line. Um, another thing I like to do is actually make a plot to show people because people don't like looking at tables of numbers. So I happen to like this, another old school base R function called mosaic plot. And it also has the nice property that you can use this X tabs function, which X tabs makes a table, and then you pass it into mosaic plot and you get this nice mosaic plot. Um, the cool thing about a mosaic plot is that the width is proportional to how many people were in each group. So if you happen to have a test where very few people were in A and a lot of people were in B, that middle line, that middle divider will kind of slide over to show you um, how many people are in A versus B, and then the vertical where this white line tells you, well, okay, these are how many opens we got for A, and this is how many opens we got for B. So that's just, I mean, I'm sure there's people on the call who can think of a lot of other ways to visualize this, um, but that's just one way that I like. Uh, all right, the next question, um, so we, we looked at opens, we should probably look at the clicks next. So does email A have a higher click rate than B? So I can use the X tabs function to just get the raw counts and it definitely looks like um, email A is better than email B in terms of the clicks. And again, I'm gonna do that prop test function and that prop test gives me um, a well, if, you're, if you like p-values, there's a very little small p-value. If you prefer confidence intervals, the confidence interval does not straddle zero. And so we have um, proof that, or evidence that there's statistical significance um, that that difference we're seeing, we have enough sample size to say, yes, that's a real difference. Um, and, uh, oh, I have this note at the bottom. I answer, I analyzed click rate among everyone who received the email and I'm ignoring in this analysis whether or not they opened the email. And that is following a general rule, which is you should never bring another Y into the analysis of a Y. You can bring in an X, which I'll show, talk about later, but you should not bring in a Y. And the reason is you, you can actually, the opening could have a selection bias uh, that changes your analysis of the, um, the other Y. And so if you use one, if you condition on one Y, I'm sorry, I'm sounding too statistical, but I'm just gonna say it the statistical way. If you condition on one Y when analyzing another Y, you can um, introduce selection uh, that makes the effect that you're seeing uh, not really what you think it is. And so um, I'm doing what is called in the medical literature or the econ literature, intent to treat. So I'm just saying, okay, I'm just gonna take all the people and analyze their clicks, whether or not they opened the email. Hopefully that made um, some sense to those of you out there. Um, the base reason for it is kind of summarized nicely in this sentence. There may be systematic differences in the types of customers who opened email A versus email B. So if we only look at the opens, we're no longer comparing those piles of equal numbers of green and red um, apples. Uh, and so it's important that you never seg segment or filter the data down based on one Y. You always want to have everyone who is in the experiment when you're analyzing a why. Um, all right. Um, so uh, I'm just like to throw in some visualization. So he here's a visualization of clicks and opens. So this might be the kind of plot that you could put in a PowerPoint deck and show to a business person because business persons apparently use PowerPoint in my experience anyway. Um, 
And so uh, that's that. All right, so actually I'm gonna pause here before we get to the last Y variable um, and see if there's any questions. I guess, Dorina, I'm doing okay kind of scanning the questions, but is there anything over in the, the Google Doc that I should answer? Uh, it kind of goes back to the, the sampling. Um, I, maybe you could look at it later um, and okay. answer the, the ones that are more current. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, I wanted, I do want to answer Rachel's question that's in the chat. So how do you determine which test to use? Um, could you use logistic regression? Yes. And we'll talk about that in module two, if we get there. Um, and, uh, or the module three, it is the first, the second module that actually has content in it. So you can use regression. Regression technically assumes that the variance is common across the two groups and the, the, bi the binomial test um, is an alternative to the logistic regression that doesn't assume that. Generally, the answer you'll get will be very similar between those two tests and so most people don't, don't sweat it. I would be perfectly fine to have people show me prop test results or show me an odds ratio from a logistic regression. They're both both fine. I would say the prop test is more common among marketers that do this stuff just by culture, um, not because it's, I mean, the only reason that it's better, uh, you could argue that it's better is because the var it doesn't assume equal variance between the two groups. Um, and if it's, so now we're going to start analyzing the purchase amount data, that data is continuous. And so we could use a linear regression or we could use a t-test. So both of those are options. And I'll show you both of them. Um, but we'll start just for this module doing a t-test. So the average 30-day purchase amount by group um, is, we saw this before, it's uh, $12 in the control group and $25 in uh, the two email groups. And, um, we can visualize that with, since it's now we have a continuous response, um, the kind of classic way to visualize that kind of continuous response across an experiment is with a box plot. But really, box plots only exist because people were trying to make visualizations literally with rulers and a pencil. And that's a little bit tedious. Um, but now that we have modern computational tools, a couple other options um, that you might want for visualization are a violin plot. So a violin plot basically is showing you the whole distribution of the 30-day purchase amount. So you can see like, oh, most of the people are right here around $20. Um, sorry, that's, I don't know what that is because this is log scale. Um, somewhere between ten and a hundred dollars, uh, and you can kind of see there's this kind of tail of people who bought a whole lot. Uh, and I'm actually using the log scale here because it squishes down those really high buyers so that they're not visually dominant in the visualization. That you kind of focus on the the meat of the distribution. Um, Oh, someone's suggesting that they put a box inside a violin plot. That's really good if your audience knows about box plots. If they don't know about box plots, I've found that this visualization seems to work a little bit better than combining the two, but it just depends on, um, it's one of those things like it depends on the audience. Uh, another option that is kind of nice is a dot plot. Um, so a dot, this, a, what a dot plot does is when dots start overlapping, you, there's a function where you can say spread the dots out. So what's really happening here is each dot is um, an individual purchase, but there's a whole bunch of dots at this particular value, and so it, it kind of spreads them out. You get the same effect as basically a violin plot. Um, so I think those are really nice ways to uh, visualize the results of an experiment, any experiment, when the outcome variable is a number. Um, the number I deal with most often is how much customers buy. Um, we should probably also do some sort of significance test on this. And so 
Um, I like to use a t-test uh, and that's pretty common in the industry. Um, so if I do purchase as a function of group, um, oh, the thing about a t-test is a t-test only can have two groups. The same is true of pop test. And uh, so it would be a little bit better to do an ANOVA or a linear regression, which a linear regression and ANOVA are under the hood the same. Um, so that would be a bit better and I'll show you how to do that uh, in the next module. But for now, we'll do the t-test with just uh, comparing email A and email B. And it gives us a p-value that's not significant and it gives us a confidence interval. So this is the confidence interval for the difference between A and B. And zero is in the middle, which you can interpret as meaning there is a good chance that the difference is zero. Um, and so that's a very Bayesian interpretation, by the way, but uh, one that works for me. And so if you take that confidence interval, like you'd say, this is not a significant difference. It looks like in terms of purchase amount, email A and email B uh, work about the same. So if you're really trying to drive the bottom line, it doesn't matter which email you send. Um, if you, you might prefer A because it does seem to be getting like some intermediate response, but it's not getting people all the way to sale. And we should probably be thinking in this case about like what is going on there. Like are, is the email like really exciting? And then when you get to the web page, you're like, uh, these prices, like maybe the email says all the wine is on sale for 75% off. And then you get to the website and there's only one variety that's on sale for 75% off. And you're like, ah, that was not as exciting as I was hoping it would be. And we don't get the purchase. Um, the other thing we can do is we can actually, I remember I told you I had that binary variable email. So with that variable, I'm just saying, did you get an email or not? So I'm lumping together everyone who got the email and doing a t-test comparing everyone who got the email, regardless of whether it was A or B, um, versus the people who didn't get the email. And that is massively significant. So we have a small p-value and our confidence interval for the difference is uh, between $12.75 and $13.90. So that's a big lift. So we can say, yes, it's a good idea to send the emails. We get a big lift in sales when we send this email. All right. Um, so uh, let me just answer a few questions. Uh, Martine asked, do you correct for multiple testing? Generally, people don't. Uh, that would be a good idea to do. So when you're doing multiple t-tests, um, you know, if you, you're, the false positive rate for a significance test at 5% is 1 in 20. So if you do 20 t-tests and one of them is significant, that one could be a false positive. Um, in general, in marketing, people don't worry about that. And I don't know if it's just that the audience is not um, sophisticated enough or what's going on there, but uh, that would be a good idea. Um, Deb has a question. To your point earlier about open rate higher due to possibly better subject line in email A, if the purchase amounts are the same on the total base, it seems the content of email B might be better than the content of email A to make up for the difference in open rates. Yeah, that's a reasonable hypothesis, Deb, um, and probably worth, uh, if I was doing a real deck to talk to this about people who are working in the business, I would put the pictures of the emails. Like, I'd even, I think it would be really cool um, if you put the emails, like, like literally um, a JPEG of the email here and here so that people immediately get that visual of what was different between the two emails. because people in the business are gonna to wanna to immediately dig into that, like what's going on here and try to understand the, the, the physics, um, the medical people would say the etiology of uh, what, was, you know, what was actually causing the one email to be different than the other email. Um, all right, so um, kind of like a high level summary that would be suitable for texting to a boss. Um, email A has significantly higher opens and clicks than email B, B, but purchases are similar for both emails. I think you should send email A. 
and both emails generate higher average purchases than control, I think we should send emails. Um, and one thing I emphasize with my students is um, analysts are often afraid to tell a business leader what they should do because they feel like it's my job is to analyze the data and it's your job to decide what to do. But sometimes they're having under trouble understanding what it is that you think they should do. So sometimes it's better to just say it directly. Like, I think this implies that you should send email A. Um, and then, I mean, obviously they can change, they can do something else. They're the decision maker and you're the analyst. Uh, but if you're more direct about what it implies, it helps people understand the analysis better. Sometimes they can like, oh, she's telling me to do this. And then they can kind of back themselves into understanding why that's what the data says. So um, I would encourage analysts, that's just my personal opinion, is I encourage analysts to tell people what they think they should do. Um, in marketing, I'm gonna caveat that. So in marketing, you should just tell people what you think they should do um, and let them ask questions if they want. I, I would not do that if I was presenting to the FDA or Congress or someone like that, probably I would, wouldn't do that. But in business, people are happy to have you just tell them what to do. Um, they might, then they might ask you why and then you can explain the data to them. All right, so the last uh, bit in this section is about the design of A-B tests. So um, some of you might be wondering, how did we decide how many people to put in each condition? And often in marketing, we just take the list and we have three treatments, so we divide the list into three and that's how we decide what our sample size is going to be. Um, but we can be a little bit smarter about that. So, um, The first thing I like to do when I'm planning out a test is answer these seven key questions, which sometimes there's seven and sometimes there are eight. I haven't really figured that out, but you should be able to answer all of these, these seven key questions about your test. What is the business question you're trying to answer? Are you going to do the test in the lab versus the field? We're mostly talking about tests that are done in the field, but you might actually bring customers into a survey setting and expose them to hypothetical marketing and then ask them what they think afterwards. That would be more of a lab type test, a hypothetical type test. Um, you should know what your unit of analysis is, which is the level at which you randomize. So if you're randomizing your treatment to the visit, your unit of analysis is the visit. And so sometimes actually in these website A-B tests, they re-randomize every single visit. So you might get a different version. If you visit the website twice, like today and tomorrow, you might get two different versions because you've been randomized into a different version. Um, and that's actually a technical violation of some of the assumptions of an experiment, but everybody just ignores it. Um, but your unit of analysis could be the customer if you're um, kind of have customer IDs and customer accounts and kind of keep track of those. And in some cases, you actually run your experiment in marketing at the store level. Um, so I, ha I haven't talked about this yet, but there's a company called um, Applied Predictive Technologies that helps, uh, helps retailers run experiments where the unit of analysis is a store and um, for all the Philly uh, R ladies in the house, um, they have a great case study where they do a experiment on a store that sells gas and soda and cigarettes and sandwiches, a lot of sandwiches. Uh, so everyone in Philly knows exactly what store it is that sells gas and sandwiches and cigarettes and coffee. I forgot coffee. Anyway, the experiment they did was to actually increase the staffing at the deli counter. Um, and someone's gonna tell, yeah, their coffee is good. Someone has to tell the rest of the people what store it is. But anyway, um, they increased the staffing at the deli counter to try to get the sandwiches made faster. And uh, they actually did that by randomizing. Some stores got more staff on the deli counter counter and some got less and then they looked at the sales at the store level. Um, so you can do an A-B test like that. Um, it's, uh, it's really cool. Um, sadly, I haven't been to a Wawa in two months because I'm not keen on going to a Wawa where there's self-service coffee. Um, 
All right, so the, the fourth thing is the treatments. Uh, so you need to know what your treatments are. You need to know what your response variables are, like how are you gonna measure it? And that is something worth having like long discussions about. A lot of people kind of like, oh, well, we'll just run these treatments and we'll measure everything. You really should think ahead, like what was the point of the treatment and am I measuring what I think that treatment is supposed to do? Um, in marketing, we have what's called a KPI, which is the key performance indicator and an experiment should have a KPI. Uh, for those of you coming from a medical background, the, you would call it a study endpoint. Uh, but there should be one response variable that's kind of the one that you are focused on going in. Um, and six and seven are how are we going to get the units, wherever these units are, how are they uh, selected to be in the study, and um, the assignment to treatments. And it's probably easier to see all of this with a, a concrete example. Um, so in our case, for the experiment uh, that we are analyzing, this would be my kind of summary of the design. Uh, does email work? If so, which email is better? Those are our core business questions. The test setting is email to retail customers. The unit of analysis is going to be the email address. Um, so if one person has two email addresses, <laughs> they're going to be in the experiment twice. Uh, the treatments are, we know about, the responses we've talked about. Um, the selection, you actually should have a plan for which emails end up in the test. And in this test, it was all active emails on the email list. So you had to have an open of an email in the last 12 months. Um, but you could, you could define other rules, but that kind of defines what is the population I'm trying to learn about. And then uh, the assignment is going to be random with a third in each group, and our sample size is going to be 123, 988 emails. Um, all right. I had no idea. I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat now. Alice did an analysis of Wawa? That's so cool. I totally missed that talk, but I would have loved to have been there. Um, I had someone from Wawa who runs the loyalty card come give a talk in my class, by the way. And it was like, I was total fangirl in the back of the room. I'm a huge uh, Wawa fan. Um, so uh, anyway, Alice says we don't need another Wawa, I guess. Any, anyway, I'll stop paying attention to the um, chat so that I can make sure I, I talk to you clearly about sample size planning, um, so, which is the last topic in this module. So um, when you, sorry, let me skip over that. So, so when you, um, You should definitely, one thing you definitely should not do, and this little code is an example of that, but I won't walk through it because frankly it's eight, you know, it's 7.30 and my brain isn't working that well, but we could look at that code another time. Um, but I just wanted to point out that you should not run your t-test as the test is ongoing, like take 100 people, run the t-test, take another 100 people, run the t-test. That's that repeated um, testing that was raised as an issue earlier. It's another form of that. You're doing the same repeated testing. And you can run the test, but what you can't do is stop the experiment when the test goes significant. So this little bit of code, what it's doing is it's running the t-test for every 100 observations and then stopping if the significance is, um, if, if it, is basically statistically significant at a p-value of 0.05. And so at that point, you, um, you stop the test. That actually creates um, an, uh, the way this little example is set up, these tests are all not significant. So the false positive rate should be 5%. But when you do that, you increase the false positive rate to 35.9%. Um, so that is something you don't want to do. Um, if you're going to use hypothesis testing, what you really should do is uh, plan the sample size out in advance and have that be the size of your test. And this is kind of more of a thing in website testing um, where you, the data is sort of streaming in. In an email test, you send the email, you get the results back. 
Uh, but in the website testing world, the data is coming in as visitors come to your site and you should not do this. In fact, my colleague that I've written a couple papers with, Ron Berman, has a paper that shows that he actually looked at whether people do do this and he took a whole bunch of data from a website testing platform on how the users were using it and it was very clear that the users were doing this. They were stopping the test when it was significant. So um, that is something you should not do. Um, what you should do is to set the sample size in advance uh, and not test for significance until the data comes in and there's a formula for the sample size. Uh, when I see this, I go, seriously? I'm supposed to plan the sample size in advance? Um, and so I am not going to talk about it today. There is some stuff in the workshop on a paper, that paper I mentioned called Test and Roll is a total, totally Bayesian approach to um, planning experiments and uh, it doesn't have these issues. But most people use the classical analysis, so that's what I'm talking about today. And so um, what I, I'm saying, the point of all this code is to say, don't test your significance as the data comes in and then stop the test as soon as it's significant. That's going to give you a lot of false positives, way more than you think you have. Um, what you really should do is plan the sample size using this formula. And if you want to um, do that in R, sorry to skip ahead. Um, I'm just thinking about the time. Um, if you want to do that, the um, function is power t-test. And I apologize that somehow that line of code got commented out. Um, but if you, oh, I know why I commented it out because the output was too long to fit on the slide. But if you look at the output, it says we should have 2,387 in each group. Um, sorry to go for, through that fast, but uh, hopefully for tonight, what you take away from that is there's a way to plan out the sample size and you could plan it. Um, and then you should round up to the nearest week because you want to run your test for an even number of weeks. So you have balance in terms of uh, traffic on different days of the week. All right. So um, just to, to wrap up this section, um, if you've never run an A-B test in marketing, I have a few kind of tips. Um, you want to keep it simple. You want to be prepared to find no effect. So um, there are often most A-B tests that practitioners run have no effect. And so you should be kind of ready for that. Like you shouldn't tell your boss, we're going to test this thing and we're going to find the perfect marketing email and life is going to be great. Um, you're kind of stumbling around in the dark and what you're searching for are a few kind of uh, golden tickets, which I mean by emails that really work a lot better than other emails. Um, and, and you want to, to that end, you kind of want to choose very strong treatments. Choose emails that you think are very different than what you've done in the past, because if you keep doing the same thing over, you're going to probably get the same marketing results. Um, and you should plan to run a lot of tests because everybody wants to get that one where it's significant and, oh, we've seen a big difference, but most of them aren't going to be. So you want to, um, you want to work quickly and keep testing stuff. Uh, the way to find a gold, golden ticket is to eat a lot of chocolate bars. And so you have to run a lot of A-B tests in order to get that golden ticket. I apologize for those that don't know the Willy Wonka movie. That metaphor got extended way too far. Um, all right, um, so uh, I'm finished up that module and I'm just thinking through what we should do with the remainder of the time. This slide that you can't really read is a sort of summary of everything we covered, which was kind of a lot. In fact, I'm happy to have gotten through that for tonight. Um, are there any questions on this stuff that I should address right now? What do you think, Darina? Uh, sure, there are some questions. Um, how do you determine whether a significant difference is meaningful? Uh, with this much data, small differences could be significant, but maybe not meaningful. And then uh, similar to that, um, would you consider reporting effect size? Some, uh, sometimes with large samples, you can get significance on the tiniest of effects. Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's tough for marketers. So 
marketing is kind of a nudge thing. You're trying to change human behavior. Human behavior is very, very noisy. And your our hope for how much we could change it is actually rather small. Like, I don't think there's an email that I could write that would get, in this case, like we had a click-through rate of 7%. I think the best that I could ever dream of doing is maybe 20%. So um, we're, lo we're actually looking for kind of small effect sizes in marketing and trying to, to be crass to exploit them. Um, so we're trying to kind of make small changes in behavior. So I, I hear you that some effects wouldn't be different. Um, I guess I do agree with you that we would want to report effect sizes. And so if, if the outcome of variable is dollars, I tend to report it in dollars. And I don't emphasize the significance, like, um, let me, pop back for an example. I would report something with a confidence interval. So this is how I typically report in business practice. Um, so I tell them like they have a higher average purchases and I'd say $25 versus $12. And then I kind of de-emphasize the statistical significance. So I am one of those people who tends to focus on effect size um, more than statistical significance. Uh, so I guess I, I agree with the sort of spirit of the question, which is we really want to focus on um, people on what are the effect sizes. The problem is with conversion rate, sometimes we are looking for very small changes in conversion rate or open rate, those kinds of things, um, where, where half a percent can actually be quite meaningful to the business. Um, hopefully that answers the questions. Were there other ones, Dorina? Yeah, uh, this goes back to the uh, emailing and sampling. Um, how do you ensure that the effect is isolated to just your email and not to the sum of emails received or interacted by the customers? Um, when measuring dollar amount, how do you know if the rate of emails received was the same? Uh, oh, if the to actually look at whether the email bounced? Is that where the question is coming from? I'm not sure I followed. Uh, I think so. So um, it would be good to monitor bounces. I didn't put it in this example, but you would want to see that the bounces are similar between groups. And if you've randomized correctly, they should be. Anything else? I know um, we have like a, a wide range of statistical sophistication in this group. Uh, do you have any um, Thai versus marketing book recommendations? Uh, so, um, say, say what, was, what kind of book were, is the questioner looking for? Uh, tidyverse marketing, tidyverse for marketing. Oh, no, there are no tidyverse marketing books right now. Um, the best thing I found is there's a, there's a web book from um, KU Leuven in, the, I guess that's in the Netherlands or is it in Belgium? Belgium. Um, they have a tidyverse based marketing book that's very nice. So I guess that would be my recommendation. There's no printed book that I know of that's uh, very tidyverse marketing based. The thing is that, uh, like in my book, in the, the later packages, um, we, uh, in, in the other packages, they're all, a lot of the packages are very base art oriented. So we started the book kind of teaching basic base art and then we jump into these packages and the packages are not, um, you know, that book was written before tidy models existed. And so uh, it probably will need to be rewritten after tidy models is, is adopted and kind of expands. Uh, but at the time it was like, well, if I'm going to show you this package for clustering and the package for clustering is very base R, I might as well just focus you on base R stuff um, before introducing the tidyverse. Uh, when people ask me um, the, when people ask me um, about uh, learning the tidyverse, I usually just say um, Hadley Wickham's book. Uh, that would be my, my best recommendation for tidyverse-based stuff. 
Um, maybe I'm, I'm wondering, I'm trying to think, should we, should we jump into the other thing where I talk about uplift modeling? Um, and, uh, and, and see that really quick. I think we should do that. Or I could just sort of take open questions. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and, and sort of show you quick what's in the, the second deck. Um, so this second deck, actually, but first, we're all going to stand up for a minute and stretch out because I've been sitting here for too long. So you guys can all, you can all stand up and stretch out because we can't sit at our computers all day long. Sorry, you had to watch my stomach stretching out. That was really kind of weird, but um, hopefully good. I'm feeling better. Um, all right. So this section is about how to um, analyze A-B tests when you have a really large sample. So there's more we can do when we have a large sample. There's other stuff we can play around with. Um, so uh, I have this quote. There's actually, this is in the GitHub. I put a copy of this paper, a really nice paper uh, from Harvard Business Review called A Step-by-Step -step Guide to Smart Business Experiments. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's a light read. Um, so when customers are randomly assigned to treatment and control groups, and there are many customers in groups, in each group, then you may effectively have multiple experiments to analyze. Um, and that is called slicing and dicing for some, I think it's because Anderson and Symester first called it slicing and dicing. Uh, but the basic idea is we're going to filter the data down to a particular subgroup and look at the effect within that subgroup. Um, another name for this that the economists use is heterogeneous treatment effects. So they're saying the treatment effect is different for different groups. Um, and so with slicing and dicing, we're trying to find that. Um, so getting back to our wine retailer experiment, and you guys have seen all of this stuff. Um, one of the baseline variables I have is days since last activity. Um, and I, as a marketer, have kind of a, a going in hypothesis that these people who've been active with us more recently are probably uh, more responsive in general, and they might be, um, you know, it might make a difference whether you send an email to someone like this, and it might make no difference whether you send an email to someone who's, you know, two years old. They haven't interacted with us in two years. Um, so uh, we can kind of think of this as experiments within experiments. So consider the customers who've been active in the last 60 days. We'll just say last 60 days you've been active. Within that subset, customers were randomly assigned to receive email A, email B, or no email. So we can actually think of that as its own, that subgroup as its own mini experiment. We slice down to that and then we reanalyze. Um, the only tricky thing about this is if you don't have enough in that group of people with 60 days, you won't get a significant result because we probably planned the sample size as an overall thing and we weren't planning the sample size for the subgroup. Although if you're smart and thinking ahead, you maybe you would have planned it for the subgroup, um, that would be good. All right, so um, I'm just gonna summarize the, uh, the data by whether or not you uh, were active in the last 60 days and what treatment you got. And so let's look at those people down here who were active in the last 60 days. And I see, oh my goodness, that purchase effect is even bigger. It's, it's like 15 bucks. Huge. 15, 16 bucks, that's great. It was like 10 or 12 before, and now it's bigger for this subgroup. Um, and it looks like for this subgroup, there's actually a little bit of difference in opens and a little bit of difference in clicks. And for the other group, um, there's a little bit of difference in opens, a little bit of difference in clicks, but absolutely no difference in the mean purchase amount. So it, sorry, there is some difference. I, I interpreted that wrong. Haven't looked at this data in a while. So um, the effects are kind of smaller 
especially this uh, purchase lift effect is much smaller for the people who weren't active. It, there's still an effect there, but it's a smaller effect. So the email seems to produce a stronger effect on purchases for recently active customers, um, just looking at the summary of the data. Um, and we could do a plot for that. Um, I'll just jump ahead. We can do a significance test. We can basically run the same game we did before, um, just looking at the subgroup of these customers who are have more recently been active with us. So, um, so I, hopefully you get the idea. Um, the simplest way to kind of look at these subgroups is just to filter down to that subgroup and rerun all your analysis. And you could write a loop to do that. Uh, so you could do it for lots of different subgroups. You are, um, someone's going to call me out on doing multiple testing. Um, you are potentially doing multiple testing, so you want to kind of keep keep that in mind and not over-interpret, you know, some one-off significant result that you get in one subgroup that doesn't make any sense. But if you're looking at subgroups that you think are likely related to how well the treatments work, um, then you can basically look at the effect within any subgroup. So it's like, just take those two stacks of apples and cut the top half off and look at the top half, there's still like a clean comparison of apples. Um, and so when you do this kind of slicing, you it's always based on baseline variables. So um, all those baseline variables, it's good to have them and actually good to think when you're running your A-B test, do I have them? Where can I get them? Um, how do I merge them in and kind of have a plan for that going in? Um, but there's like so many uh, interesting possible baseline variables. This is just a list of things that I think of as a marketer. So um, data on whether you visited the website before, data on any signups for special things you've signed up for, your geographic location. In retail, geographic location can be uh, really a big deal. Like you could have an email that features raincoats and an email that features beach hats, I don't know. And um, obviously those emails are gonna perform differently in South Beach than they do in Maine. Um, and so ge geography is a good thing to know about customers. Um, source, which is the digital marketing term for uh, how they arrived at your website. Did they do a Google search or did they click a link that they saw on Facebook? That kind of thing can be very important. Um, the past purchase, and you can look at that by category. Um, and then these two marketing measures, recency just means how long has it been since you last made a purchase, and frequency is how often do you tend to buy from us. And all of those things are great baseline variables to include in marketing experiments. I'm gonna skip the exercise. Um, so for those of you who called me out early on multiple significance testing, this is the warning. Um, and my approach to multiple significance testing is when you think you found a golden ticket, just retest before you bet the company. Just rerun the test. Like if you get a significant result and you're like, gosh, that was strange, um, just rerun the test and see if you get it again. Um, so that's kind of the idea of slicing and dicing. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little fast. I just want to make sure we have plenty of time to wrap up. Um, So um, I am going to next very quickly show you how you can analyze an experiment with uh, a regression because that'll let me show you how you can kind of like quickly slice and dice using a regression. So sorry, I'm moving kind of fast here. The slides are here. I'm here. You can email me um, if you get stuck on something later. All right, so um, the way we analyze an experiment with a regression model is a regression model would be something like the outcome Y is some unknown A plus B, which is also unknown, times X, which is some kind of indicator for the treatment, um, plus an error term. And like literally, the mo this is a model that says that's how the data is generated. Um, and when we fit a model, we use that model to estimate the A and the B. And so in R, we do this with, um, we shorthand the model with um, a formula like this. So we say the purchase you get is a function of whether or not you got an email. 
Um, and that's, so purchase is a function of email is how I typically read that. Um, and that means exactly the same thing as the perch variable equals A plus B times email plus some noise. And we're gonna estimate the A and the B from the data. And so um, this is how we would analyze the, the, I'm analyzing here whether or not um, getting an email affects your purchase amount. So for this analysis, I've combined the A and the B versions of the email together. And I get that purchase is a function of whether or not you got an email. And it tells me this number right here, that's the B number in the equation. And it says, when you get an email, you tend to spend $13.32 more on average. Um, and so that's an alternative way of analyzing the experiment. And one of the questioners asked about a logistic regression. You could use that logistic regression to analyze opens. I just didn't put it in the slide deck because I was kind of aiming a little bit lower um, level of statistical sophistication. Um, all right. The one thing I wanted to show you is that the results we get from the t-test are very similar to the results we get from the regression. So um, the p-value from the t-test is down here and it's very, very small. And the p-value from the regression is right here and that's also very small. Those will technically be different, but they're usually fairly similar. Um, and the estimate of the effect size is going to be the same across the two groups. So um, here it's just written in a different way. So here it says that the intercept is 12. That means the control group spends on average 12.42. And um, in the t-test, the we get that same result. And then there's an additional $13 that you get for $13.32 that you get when you get an email. And if you add 13.32 to 12.42, you'll get this 25.74. So they're, they're basically just two different statistical tests kind of getting at the same thing, which is does the email increase sales? And we are getting that that's statistically significant. Um, and if you like regression, you can use regression to analyze all your tests. Um, if you don't like regression, you should try it because it gives you the ability to pull in baseline variables into the analysis in a very natural way. So here I'm taking, we have this model, uh, this days since, and I'm putting that into the regression and along with email. So now I get um, a multiplier for email, so $13 more. And I also get that people who um, have purchased more recently tend to buy uh, $15.92 more on average. And this kind of analysis where I'm putting those baseline variables into the regression is called in marketing, it's sometimes called regression correction. Um, but what this doesn't do is it doesn't, it basically just says there's an extra $16 or so boost for being a customer who's interacted with us some, somewhat recently. Um, and uh, what we want to do, let me go back, sorry. What we really want to do here is we want to know if the effect of the email is different for those people who've bought recently. And the best way to do that is to actually put it in as an interaction effect. So um, when we add an interaction effect, we, we are defining a model that's going to multiply that x variable times the z variable, and we're going to get a coefficient on that. And that's kind of the difference in treatment effect for that group. Um, so the way we do this in R is we would say purchase is a function of email plus your days since last purchase, you know, your, whether you're in that recent purchase group. And then this interaction term that multiplies the two of those. Uh, and you, you indicate that in R with a colon. Uh, or you can just shorthand it. This email times days since less than 60 is, means the same thing as um, the formula right above it. 
And so if I run that model, I get that, um, so I have an effective email, and this, which is a little bit lower than it was before, because that's for the customers who are, don't have recent activity. And then this is the additional effective email if you do have activity. Um, and so that, um, that boosts up. Now, some of you may have been wondering, why are these numbers in the equations? They're all half what's up here. Um, and that's because I've actually coded the variables as minus ones and plus ones. And so actually all of these numbers up here are twice what the effect is between the treatment and the control. Uh, sorry for that slightly confusing thing. Um, all right, so that is um, actually what is, sorry, I'll stop there, pause on that slide. So that's how we can actually um, use regression model to find what are these heterogeneous treatment effects in a rather sort of quick and all at once way. So you can have multiple of these baseline variables, bring them in, interact them with the treatment effect and see how, um, how do these baseline variables affect the treatment effect. Um, the other little nuance here is these should always be um, binary variables. Um, to make all of this interpretable. The, the Z's, the Z variables should be binary variables. Um, and I think actually that's probably the right place to stop. So I, I apologize, I knew we weren't gonna make it all the way through um, two, um, through, through the, I guess it's module three, I keep getting confused because there's the intro module, then the first module that's module two and the second module that's module three. Uh, so we didn't make it all the way through, um, but you can read through that. I'd ha be happy to do a follow-up um, meetup to kind of go through more of it if there was interested in that. Um, but maybe I'll just pause there and stop for questions. Um, I'm looking at the chat and I see the, the, the most recent question is, how can you reach me privately? I'm a professor at Drexel, so if you Google me, you will find my email address rather quickly, or it's just ellyfight at gmail.com is the best way to reach me. Um, so yeah, you feel free to, to email me if you like. Um, other questions I can answer? Uh, why do you report with confidence interval, intervals versus p-values? Uh, why do I choose to report confidence intervals versus p-values? Because I'm actually a Bayesian and I find p-values really confusing, uh, both for me and for um, when I, I report a lot to people who are very, have very low statistical training, like maybe they took a stats class 20 years ago and they don't remember it and they hated it. Because in business school, Stats is like this kind of weed out course that, you know, it's like we make people take and they don't like it. Um, so they mostly forget it. And so I find for that kind of audience, the confidence interval, especially if you interpret it in a Bayesian way, you say, this is the range of likely values of that. Um, so I, what I do is I, sometimes I'll report the classical confidence interval, but I'll kind of describe it in a Bayesian way. And I find that that works for people. If I say like the lift of this email is between six dollars and eight dollars they understand that if i say the difference in between the getting an email and not an email is statistically know what that means at all they so they just have to trust me that i did the analysis correctly or something and so i just find it less intuitive so that's why i tend to lean towards um confidence intervals and i tend to describe them in a bayesian way which is i I say that, and I'm going to get sort of super technical here for those who are interested. In my head, um, the asymptotic standard errors are also a normal approximation to the Bayesian posterior. So it's fair to interpret them in a Bayesian way and say, um, this is the range of likely values of that number. Um, hopefully I didn't get like too uber Bayesian there. Um, that I know that like your intro stats teacher would smack your hand with a ruler for saying something like that. But uh, I, I think it works in terms of driving the correct decision. So I feel more comfortable with that. 
Um, other questions? Um, is there a silico salvation if data is not randomized? Is there a salvation? Yes, that's like an active area of research. Um, and I'm not super expert in it, but yes, there are, um, especially in the clinical trials literature, there's a couple of really good biostatisticians that focus on um, trying to rescue uh, situations where there's been some kind of error in the randomization or what what more often happens is you get treatment non-compliance in the medical space so people don't um, they don't get the treatment that you really wanted to analyze so there there's methods for um, actually some Bayesian methods for analyzing experiments uh, that are like that um, it tends it tends so marketing experiments tend to be so quick and cheap to run that if that happened your best mitigation is just run it again um just because you know we're not talking about patients and drugs and all kinds of expensive things we're talking about sending an email just just send another email is kind of the best mitigation in marketing anything else i wanted to give enough time for the the host to wrap up the meetup. I am okay. I'm so excited after this is over to read the comments because I, I really can't couldn't follow the whole chat while I was presenting, but it seems like there's lots of good stuff in there. I love when people are cooperative and answer each other's questions. It's just great. And hopefully I'll learn something by reading all of it. Will you be writing a book on A B testing? I am not writing a book on A-B testing. I was at one point working on a book with my colleague, um, Bruce McCullough. So he's a, a stats professor at Drexel. And the book, he, it went to Wiley. It's gonna be published by Wiley sometime in the next year. And it, I wrote some of the pages, uh, but I'm not going to be an author on the book. Um, I just got, too busy with other stuff and sort of dropped the project. So, uh, but Bruce finished it up. So that, that would be something worth uh, taking a look at. You can also take my class at Drexel. Um, it's pretty popular class. So it usually fills up with students who've matriculated into one of our master's programs, but I spend basically a full semester. And as part of that, you run a project where you run an experiment and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, I wish I had more time to write books, but, uh, oh, I should mention, I do have another book coming out. So um, a co-author took the R for marketing book and adapted it to Python. So is, the book is coming out in October. It's called Python for Marketing Research and Analytics to be a companion. And it literally, he, he um, we keep the book in a, a GitHub repo and he literally cloned the repo and uh, translated it to Python. So some of the sentences are actually sentences that I wrote for the R book. Um, so he, he basically changed the code and then changed the text as it needed to change. But some of the text stayed the same, which is kind of cool. And I just proofread it a month ago um, and it looks really nice. It doesn't, it doesn't have as much breadth as the R book because the package support isn't there. But it goes a little bit deeper into the machine learning, like um, clustering and classification models that you can do in scikit-learn. So um, I'm excited about that. That should be out in October. Um, someone asked, what's a good Bayesian book for marketing people? Sorry, I just saw the last thing in the chat. Um, and suggested Rossi, Allenby, and McCullough. I am not a big fan of Rossi, Allenby, and McCullough. It's written to teach you how to build a Gibbs sampler. And I don't know that that's really, um, like, I don't want a shop manual for a car that tells me how to repair it. What I really want is an owner's manual for the car that tells me how to drive it and maintain it. Uh, and so there really isn't anything great written in marketing from a Bayesian perspective. Um, if I write another book, that'll be the book. I've always wanted to write a book that's like, Bayesian analysis for marketing, an owner's manual. Uh, so I guess you heard it here first. If I ever get around to writing that book, that would be probably my next book. 
Um, oh, someone mentioned Matt Gershoff. I'm friendly with Matt Gershoff. You can, if you follow us on Twitter, we do um, talk to each other once in a while. And I had dinner with him a year ago uh, at a marketing conference in um, Las Vegas. It was sadly in Las Vegas, not my favorite place. But uh, yeah, Matt writes some really good stuff from a Bayesian perspective. Um, Sometimes I don't follow Matt, so it might be the most accessible. Like sometimes I really have to think hard to understand Matt. I think he thinks really deeply, but sometimes I don't always follow. So uh, just buyer beware on that. All right, I guess I'll hand it back to you, Darina. Okay, uh, thank you, Ali. This was great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Happy to be here.